which we you know didn't mention below in the beginning but again could we cut and just start over <laughs> hey guys it's cam with crafting tailored in this episode of what is on my wrist we're talking about an anti-magnetic rolex that's right it is a rolex milgauss the specific reference that we're going to be talking about today is a reference 1019 from 1972. This is an exceptional example. It's one of the nicest reference 1019s that we've ever had and probably the nicest one that I've ever seen. Cool. And it's also a very complete example with some really cool history. So I figured why not use this as a way to talk about the Milgauss reference as a whole because we haven't featured a Milgauss on the channel yet. And also to talk about the 1019, which is a really awesome sports watch. Before we get into the details, do us a favor, like, comment, and if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel. That really helps us out and allows us to keep producing this content for you guys. So what I think we should do is talk a little bit about basically the history of the Milgauss and kind of give you a bit of an introduction into why the Milgauss was created, why Rolex launched the reference as a whole and give you a basis of understanding for the model itself. So this kind of all starts in 1956 actually, the 6543 and 6541 were introduced by Rolex in 1956. Rolex was working with a lot of scientific communities in this era and time, it's basically the atomic era. Rolex was working with the European Organization for Nuclear Research, also known as CERN, in Geneva to create a watch that could withstand high fields of magnetism. Milgauss, developed in 1956 for scientists and engineers. A soft iron shield safeguards the precision of its movement against magnetic disturbances. The name Milgauss is also really interesting because Milgauss is derived from the French name of mil, which means 1000, and Gauss, which is a unit of measurement of magnetic fields. <laughs> Let me start that again. Mill, uh, which means 1,000, and Gauss means 1,000 Gauss, and that is basically uh, the element or level of magnetism that the early Milgausses could withstand, which is 1,000 Gauss. So let's talk a little bit about the first Milgauss references, and then we'll dive into um, kind of the 1019, as the 1019 was the longest produced uh, Milgauss by Rolex, and then move into kind of the modern era of uh, the Milgauss. Let me get my notes just queued up real quickly here. Bum, 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 bum. So if we look at um, the 6541s and the 6543s, you'll notice a couple things within the reference. One, we've got this beautiful waffle dial. Black dial, red Milgauss text, it's really awesome. We have doffing hands, as well as this really eye-catching lightning bolt sweep seconds hand. There's basically kind of two offerings um, within the dial variants. One, which kind of makes it an interesting watch from a sports watch perspective because in this era, instead of it being like a gilt glossy dial with luminous material directly applied to the dial, you kind of have like this hybrid waffle dial with applied markers at the three, six, and nine, and then also luminous material. There's also a couple of dial variants that were typically uh, issued or used by scientists within the community that didn't want any radioactivity on the dials themselves. So there's actually early dials within in the earlier 6543 range and obviously the 6541s where there's actually no loom dials essentially. The other th interesting thing is that there are two bezel variants for the early Milgausses. There's kind of this stainless steel or smooth bezel and then there's also a bezel that is kind of similar to the early Submariners brass bezel that like rotates similar to like what you would see on like a Turner graph or a sub out of that era with the most common being you know the 6541s with the outer rotating bezel. What really makes the watch anti-magnetic is Rolex's introduction of a Faraday cage. So in the back of every single Milgauss, including the 1019, and then the modern version of the 116400, which is basically still around today, there's basically this iron Faraday cage that repels the magnetism, and that's what allows the watch to be anti-magnetic. And again, that was introduced in 1956 with you know, the 6541s um, in that reference range. 
All right, so now that you have a basis of understanding of just kind of how the Milgauss was introduced and, and what the scientific need is, let's talk a little bit about uh, the reference 1019, specifically this one from 1972 that I've got on wrist. When the Milgauss reference 1019 was released in 1960, there were a lot of substantial changes to the reference in one way or another that kind of demonstrated a dissatisfaction uh, on behalf of the brand with the first Milgauss iteration. And I think that with Rolex, if we look at, you know, like Submariners or Explorers or whatever, you know, throughout history, these references and these models kind of become, you know, staples of the brand, but they kind of go through these slight changes while maintaining, I guess, some things that are kind of common through uh, the reference range as a whole. So the reference 1019 was actually released in 1960, and it actually has a lot of new features with the reference while still maintaining some technical applications throughout the reference range. One definitely still has a Faraday cage. So within the back of the watch, Watch. Rolex is leveraging a caliber 1580 movement, but on top of that caliber 1580 movement, you actually have this Faraday cage, and we'll show you some photos of that. Also, what's interesting with the reference is there's like this X spring in the back of the case, which kind of, as you tighten the case back down onto the mid case, it kind of holds that you know Faraday cage on top of the movement security. So really innovative technical designs under the hood of the watch. What's interesting too about the Milgauss is it kind of almost looks like an oyster uh, perpetual or maybe even a date just, but what's really cool is that the Milgauss has flat sides to the case. So it's an oyster case and it's an oyster perpetual with 20 millimeter lug widths. It accommodates a 20 millimeter oyster bracelet, but, but what's unique about the Milgauss is the case isn't actually 36, it's actually 38 millimeters. And I think that that was designed by Rolex to accommodate that Faraday cage and a watch that was a little bit more visible in terms of its size. So kind of interesting with the introduction of the 1019, um, we have this you know, 38 millimeter case. The other thing too is all 1019s have this smooth outer stainless steel bezel. Obviously the difference between the earlier Milgauss and now the modern Milgauss is that you have this more contemporary dial format for the 60s into the 70s. And the Milgauss actually was in production from 1960 all the way until 1988, making it one of the longest Rolex four digit sport watches ever produced, which is really interesting as well. With the introduction of the 1019, we also see that honeycomb dial now replaced by a more contemporary 60s and 70s style of dial being either black and or silver instead of just black. And then we have these applied baton markers and then we move away from the doffing hands and we move into these alpha hands which are basically unique to the 1019. And then we move away from that lightning bolt sweep seconds hand and we see a sweep seconds hand that is very much similar to the Rolex Daytona sweep seconds hand that you would see in the four digit range with these really cool red colored tips which really jump off the dial. So uh, the 1019 remained a staple of the Rolex catalog as we were saying for almost 30 years. It was completely retired in 1988. And it's not strange, I guess, to see Rolex sunset uh, a model, but generally this occurs when a newer and better version is ready to kind of take that model's place. In 88, when the 1019 was discontinued, there wasn't another Milgauss that kind of replaced the reference until 2007. This watch actually um, has some really cool history behind it. Um, da, 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 drive this specific watch was purchased in 1973 by Owen Chadwick. And we have a letter here that was sent to Bonhams in London when the watch originally surfaced from the original owners. The watch's production date is probably late 1971, early 1972, based on the serial number, but it wasn't uncommon for watches like this to sit in a retailer's case for a while because they were kind of specific. I really like wearing 1019s because they're kind of a watch that flies a bit under the radar. You kind of have to be on the inside to really understand what this watch is. Otherwise, it kind of just looks like a silver time only Rolex, if that makes sense. I don't know if I really have a preference as opposed to like a silver dial versus a black dial. In my opinion, the silver dials wear a little bit larger. They wear more like a 40 to me. It just is very comfortable and it's a nice time only piece. The watch actually is accompanied by its original box 
um, its chronometer, you know, wax seal. Obviously, Milgausses being used for uh, scientific research, they were superlative chronometers, which was important for the scientific community. And then the other really cool thing too that we have is the original Rolex Milgauss instruction booklet, which is one of my most favorite instruction booklets that Rolex ever produced because you have like these like scientists like working with all this incredible stuff. Like I don't even know what these guys are doing, but it looks really uh, intense and very technical. And then what's even cooler about this is you actually have a CERN dial being pictured in this booklet. So this was the retail booklet, but you actually have a CERN uh, dial black enameled hands and, and dial in the in the booklet. The watch actually did receive service a couple of times. So it was serviced in 2010. It was serviced in 2019. You have the a couple of service certs, which are obviously serialized, which is a nice thing to have with a watch like this, making it really a complete full set. The original Rolex translation papers, which is cool. And then the Rolex booklet here, which um, is also punched in the back um, from its original date of sale with the original owner's uh, name in the back, which is really a nice kind of um, accent to complement the watch. So um, this watch will be available for sale on our website. I'll provide a link in the description below, um, but really awesome piece. I was very excited to share this with you. The watch is really incredible too. The bracelet is very, very tight. The case uh, remains in what I would consider maybe lightly polished condition. Mrs. Chadwick actually talks about her husband, Owen, she says, my husband was worried about damaging such a precious item that he rarely wore it. And he actually bought a second cheaper watch for everyday use. Really, really interesting story, but the watch definitely is kind of that mint keystone example, being that it's most likely unpolished based on my experience with the reference and a beautiful example nonetheless. So excited to share this with you guys. Thanks for tuning in guys. As always, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you're not doing so already, be sure to follow us on Instagram. And if you've got watch questions, we're here and happy to help. Drop us a line at info at craftandtailor.com. I will see you guys in the next one. Good? Good. Okay.